So, all right, so this panel's about the economics of cannabis in Illinois. I'm sure a lot of people are very interested in the bill that was just introduced. Um, so we're going to get to that later because I want you guys to stick around for the whole panel. Um, so let's start with the current program. Uh, we've got a medical marijuana program here. It's still a pilot program, technically um, been fairly slow to develop compared to some other states. Uh, can, can the panelists talk a little bit about what this program has looked like to date? Yeah, so um, just to kind of give a snapshot of the numbers, we're at about 62,000 patients right now. Um, and that has gone up even in the past two or three months since February when the state rolled out their new opioid pilot program, which allows anyone that is prescribed an opioid to access medical cannabis. Um, the other big things that they did back in February were that they um, eliminated the background check and fingerprint requirements for patients, which made things a lot easier and quicker for patients to get their medical cards. And they've also started granting provisional cards, which if you apply, you can get your card immediately and download it sort of like you would a plane ticket on your phone and get into a dispensary that way instead of waiting what was taking up to three months um, for the state to process your application. So, you know, all over the state, the numbers are up as far as um, foot traffic into the dispensaries. Um, and I think we'll see that the May numbers haven't been released yet. They usually release them at the beginning of the month. So I think we'll see that go going up, you know, kind of exponentially. You know, the market uh, in Illinois for the medical side has made great strides. Um, it started out, I think, with a very rough rollout and some uncertainty as we were changing governors right at that particular point in time. I don't think it's any shock or secret to say that our uh, prior governor was no fan of this industry and uh, probably, uh, well, not probably, did a very good job of standing in the way of really giving the program a chance to grow, I think, in the way that most people anticipated that it would grow. Uh, and the hope is, is that now that Governor Pritzker is in charge, that he's going to kind of take the shackles off of that a little bit and really let the medical program go where it needs to go. But uh, we should all bear in mind that under the current law, uh, the program has just about a year left, July of 2020, if the Illinois State Legislature doesn't expand and make the medical program or make it permanent, and that shouldn't be lost in all the shuffle and excitement uh, about adult use. I, and I, I think one of the positive things that's come out of being in what I think we would all agree was the most restrictive marketplace in the United States when the program first rolled out, I think the the initial conditions were like nine. Yeah, you know? Jer Jersey may have been a little Maybe, bit right. restrictive. Uh, but what if you look at the, the landscape of the companies that have come out of Illinois, um, there's arguably four or five of the top 10 uh, MSOs that have come out of Illinois. You've got the GTIs, you've got the Crescos. And I think by being in a highly regulated uh, and restrictive environment, it forced some really significant capital to come into the space and best practices to come out of the space. And Illinois has actually become a leader in the international marketplace as a result of, of that early, you know, kind of restraints that were put on us. You know, it's fascinating. I mean, you have uh, really probably four or five of the, I would say, top 12 MSOs in the country that are headquartered here in Chicago um, that came out of this market, which is interesting given that it's, you know, it's by and large been a pretty crappy market. Um, right? I mean, this is not, it's on the face of it where you would think investors would be pouring lots of money right into the Illinois market where you've got a pilot program, you've got a really restrictive list of qualifying conditions. Um, I mean, everybody knew from day one this was not going to be the best sort of commercial market. And yet, you do have some of these largest players in the country that came out of here. So, I mean, David, you, you mentioned some of those reasons. I'd be curious to hear a little more from the panel. Why has Illinois and Chicago in particular become such a hotbed for national companies given the, I mean, the relative weaknesses of the, of the program? I'll comment on that. The, um, I can't underscore David's. Mike. I cannot underscore David's point enough that um, we happen to be one of the most restrictive, most difficult states to open up in. The capital uh, I was involved in looking at, the, at these companies as they rolled out. The the intensive capital investment for a single facility license is upwards of 10 to 15 million as a minimum. Okay, per license, and you have 15 operators here in, in Illinois. And the grow side. Uh, right, and, and on the grow side. And on, on that grow side, I believe in the first year you had seven to 10,000 patients. I mean, it was two years. Yeah, you can't imagine the, the kind of financial stress these companies went under. And I know this because they had to go after round after round. So to your point, I think it, it came out of the fact that we were lucky and blessed that we had very strong capital markets and hedge funds centered in Chicago that understood this and, and, and were well-schooled in terms of going the distance in, in these investments. They, they approached it 
not as a, a gamble and not as a lark. It was very well thought out of and very well supported from an investor base. I would agree with that. And I think that a lot of these guys from day one knew what they were going to do or had very good ideas. And the fact that Illinois was so restrictive uh, gave them great incentive to look outside of the state of Illinois and to look at other states. But, but they're all highly, highly qualified people who are all successful in other businesses. And in that respect, it's not really surprising at all. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think a lot of people in other states out west, for example, um, the industry was built on the backs of folks that maybe were growing illegally, um, had been dabbling in it in some other way. But here, it wasn't like that. You know, you had lawyers leaving their jobs. You had real estate executives leaving their jobs. I think part of that is because it was so restrictive. The law was so complicated. You needed a lawyer, you know, to be behind a company to get it up and running and understand what all the restrictions were. Um, but I think it was, it's been really interesting for me covering this industry. You know, up until really last summer, I think the biggest narrative was how all of these companies here were getting creative to find capital. You know, were they going to go public in Canada? Were they going to somehow convince an investor to invest in them? Um, were they going to move to another state and operate, which obviously is a big challenge to overcome in and of itself, but it does open up more capital in that way. Um, again, as recent as last summer, there are a lot of companies here that weren't, had not recouped their investments from 2014. Well, still, that still haven't. Still, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know. sorry, we're talking about increased patient numbers, right? We're at 60,000 patients or so now. A state of 13 million people, that's not a lot. Yeah, usually it's two to three percent. That's think. right. Um, and here, besides the opioid provision that I mentioned earlier, um, it's still at about 40 conditions, and, um, you know, chronic pain is not one of them. That's the biggest condition, qualifying condition in most states. Well, let's, let's, yeah. Let, yeah, let's, I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about that. And as we're talking about the development of the program to date, this has been, this has been not only discussed, but actually litigated, um, this issue of adding chronic pain and so on. Can we, can we talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's happened to date or the efforts to date to, to get more qualifying conditions added and, and where does that currently stand? Well, sure. We did not have a lot of success following the rules. The rules required submitting petitions to the governor's board made up of 12 people who would meet every six months, and they would decide. Uh, twice, the governor's board came back to the Department of Health with 12 conditions uh, that they had all approved unanimously. And both times, uh, they were told, no, thank you, and they were turned away. And uh, so the governor rejected his own panel's recommendation. The, government reje the governor rejected his own. He's allowed to do that. He was allowed to do that under the law, yes. So what happens from there? Well, so what happens from there is we wind up with people filing lawsuits. Um, and uh, actually, it's been fascinating. The, the, the lawsuit that was filed for retractable pain, the, the theory was one of equal protection, that the state cannot, on the one hand, declare that cannabis is a medicine, but then on the other hand, determine that it can be a medicine for some conditions but not for other conditions in what seemed like a very random uh, way that they did it. And, and the state lost in the trial court, and the trial judge ordered the state to start admitting patients into the program with chronic pain. Uh, immediately, uh, Governor Rauner's administration took the matter up on appeal, and as a result, the status quo was maintained pending the ruling on the appeal. But it's still on appeal. Uh, Governor Pritzker could uh, direct uh, Kwame Raoul, the state attorney general, tomorrow to go in and withdraw the state's objection, and that would, in effect, immediately add chronic pain to the list of uh, uh, conditions that would allow you in. Just to be clear, I don't, it's not chronic pain. Is it? It's, it's post-surgical intractable pain, intractable which is, pain. is slightly yes. different. Yes. It's still wide open, but not quite as wide open as chronic pain. You're right. And that hasn't happened. The governor has not taken that step yet. No. Um, and there's a lot of people questioning why. I mean, the governor campaigned on expanding the medical program and on, legal, and on legalizing. The easiest, thing, the easiest thing that the governor could do to expand the medical program is, say, drop this appeal. And all of a sudden, you've got intractable pain and a number of other conditions that would qualify. Why, why, why do folks think that hasn't happened yet? I, I think that takes away some of his political power to be able to push through the adult use. If all of a sudden, you are able to open the market widely to chronic pain or intractable pain, then there's less of an argument. And you could split the, even the majority or the supermajority of we Democrats even more. And they can say, well, we, you know, we can kick adult use down the road. So, I mean, Pritzker's a businessman, right? If, if I'm him, I'm going to push through that legislation, and then I'll circle back and remove, you know, the blocks to, to the Do medical conditions. If the bill doesn't pass, then... Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I think we should also say, too, that there is a bill that's been introduced that would make the medical program permanent, because right now, I think you said that... Bob Morgan's bill. Yeah, it's yeah. still a pilot program in Illinois. Yeah, it expires next summer. Um, we've got about 16 months or so left, I believe, until the, the program is technically expired. Maybe last year. Um, 
yeah, so less. Um, so let's, let's, talk, let's talk about, the, the, let's stay on this, this issue of the qualifying conditions, because that really is what drives, uh, you know, drives the market. We look at a state like Arizona has got about, I think, just over 5 million people, maybe 6 million people. There's, I think, over 200,000 patients there now, right? And we're still at 60,000 in a state of 13 million people here in Illinois. So it's a pretty poor patient count um, compared to what you see in a lot of the more mature medical markets. Um, Ali, you mentioned the opiate bill. Um, and that, 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 that bill was meant to expand the patient population. And I think we've seen that it has had an effect. It hasn't quite had the effect, it seems, that, um, that folks may have expected, though. Um, so what, what have we seen out of the, out of, out of the opiate bill? Um, so I think from what I'm hearing from operators, the biggest influx of patients right in early February, right after they passed that bill, was from the folks that were granted provisional access. Like I talked about earlier, they could get in quick. They didn't have to wait for the application to be processed. Um, we've been seeing a, uh, the opioid has been making a difference. They're reporting numbers on that separately from the medical cannabis program because it's seen as, you know, two different things. And um, in April, there were about 1,000 patients enrolled in that. Um, so pretty low numbers, I think, for now. Um, everyone's, all the operators are expecting that to really pick up. Um, in other states, I had mentioned um, with chronic pain, which is, you know, different than allowing opioid patients, um, but you do get some of that population. Um, two to three percent of the population. So I don't know what that is here. Like, we, we have room to grow for like a couple hundred thousand more patients yeah, easily. is what folks are expecting. Um, yeah, easily. And, and growers and operators are ready for that. They're preparing for that. Um, you know, we can get into this later too once we talk, talk about the new legislation that was introduced over the weekend. But um, operators here are ready. They're, they're getting ready for uh, recreational too. But they say that they can also handle a steadily increasing patient count because you know, as the program grows and as rec if recreational comes online, like it's expected to, um, the medical program will also grow as well, just because more people are aware of it. There's still people in Illinois that don't even know we have a medical program. So education's a big part of um, what's keeping that growth at bay right now. Um, so we'll see. The opioid thing, and I'll kick it back to you, Chris, because you pointed something out earlier. It's still disproportionately beneficial to the people who are less disproportionately affected by what's going on. There are not opioid patients in the south side of Chicago because they don't have insurance. That's, that's right. So uh, my company, Forefront, we, we own and operate uh, Mission, uh, which is the only dispensary right now on the south side of Chicago down in South Shore. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty economically depressed area by and large, and we've seen very little impact uh, from the opiate right. bill. Um, we have seen an increase in patients. We continue to see a steady increase, but we were seeing a steady increase before the opiate bill. It has gone up a bit since then, but uh, from what we're hearing, from talking with other operators, from the statistics that are being released, um, this bill has really impacted the dispensaries in the suburbs um, and in the high-income areas, um, where you tend to have more people with opiate prescriptions, you tend to have more people with health insurance. It hasn't really uh, impacted the businesses nearly as much in lower income areas where you don't have as many people with those prescriptions, where people are more likely already getting their opiates from the illicit market, um, and so they don't have the prescription, um, and you just have not seen that increase in, in uh, the number of patients in the, in the lower income dispensaries. So, all right, well, let's, let's, let's start moving to what's coming here. The legalization bill has been introduced. There's a lot of exuberance around, um, around it and, and a lot of media in the last few days around this thing and whether it's going to pass. So, um, Ali, you've been covering this for a while. Do you want to sort of kick us off here and, and give us some of the high-level highlights of, uh, of what's, what's currently in the bill? Yeah, for sure. So, from a consumer standpoint, the bill would allow um, each person to possess uh, 30 grams um, of cannabis, and that's per household. And also, you can grow five plants in a locked room, you know, that's not, not visible, accessible to public. Not visible They're from visible the outside. From the outside, yes. Um, you know, from the business. They're literally legalizing closet growers. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it'll be interesting to see if more clarity comes out around that, because I feel like there's some natural light that might be needed in there. Yeah, yeah it'd be nice if you oh, could grow in your backyard. Right. I think right. about my little plants at home, and they would not do well in a closet. Right. Um, <laughs> Not cannabis plants, regular plants. <laughs> um, <laughs> wink, wink. Right. But um, so uh, on the business side, there's a huge social equity aspect of it. Um, right now, the diversity numbers in, as far as operators go in the industry are not great. Um, part of that is because there was such a high barrier to entry, um, such high application fees, um, licensing fees, that type of thing um, with the medical program. So there's a huge portion that addresses that. They're looking at um, bringing in some money from the medical program and then, um, you know, the recreational program to back loans and, um, you know, financially subsidize some of these folks that want to get into the industry. 
Um, they're looking at letting the medical operators, now the growers, become growers and keep those licenses just at those numbers for the first year. Um, and there's a, the bill is over 500 pages long, so there's a lot more to it than that, but hopefully that's a good overview. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, anything anyone else wants to add? Any provisions that we didn't, uh, we didn't hit on yet? Well, I, I think the, um, the 800,000 um, uh, previous um, convictions uh, is a big deal, um, very big deal. I think you were talking about that in terms of, Larry, what that means for the economies, the local economies, especially in the areas we are on the south side where it's economically depressed, these people can't get jobs. I mean, this is a real stigma for a lot of people. It's a, that's a huge portion of population, 800,000. 800,000 is a lot of people. I mean, it's a state of 13 million people. That's like right, one, 7, 8 percent of the population. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a big percent of that. And then when you're saying 800,000 people, we're talking about record expungement here. Right, and so can we talk through the mechanics of what that would look like, what, what expungement itself would look like? Um, is it something where folks are gonna have to apply to the state to get their records expunged, or is the onus on the state to go and find anybody with the cannabis? Actually, the way it's written is the police departments are gonna be responsible for identifying people in their communities, yep. and then they'll run the program to get the expungements through, I'm sure they'll come up with a committee or whatever it is. Um, that should be pretty interesting. <laughs> I imagine that's not going to be popular amongst a lot of law enforcement agencies. I can't see it being very well, popular. I don't think it's going to be popular among a lot of the people in the communities either. Right. They have to go back to the people that put them in the system in the first place to get out of the system. I think there's a lot of details that are going to still have to be worked out about this. Oh, no doubt. I mean, look, it, it, as, as an old school activist and advocate on this, I mean, I, the onus, in my mind, the onus should absolutely be on the state. Sure. Right? I mean, if you have a conviction, the state put you through the ringer on that, the onus should be on them to find They the have all the records, and, and, too. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. They have the records. It should not be on the individual to have to go and seek out the state and, and get the records. I think it's but, unclear. I think it's the police departments are responsible for identifying the people in their community. I don't believe that the people in the community have to go to the police stations to get it. It's still a little unclear. Well, it may not be unclear. I haven't read all 500 pages, so. <laughs> and, and, in most, and in most states, the way they've dealt with this is that the onus is on the individual with the record um, to then apply to the state to have the record expunged, which most people are not gonna do. Right. Uh, because they don't, they don't know how, they, right. don't understand, they don't know that the law is in place. There's a fee generally associated with doing that. Um, and like you said, a lot, a lot of people are going to want to walk into the police station that put them in jail in the first place and say, hey, get rid of my record, um, right? Particularly in communities that have been disproportionately targeted by law enforcement for marijuana crimes, uh, or marijuana, well, which will no longer be crimes, right? Love of drug offenses, yeah. Uh, I think there's two really interesting things about the social equity program, though. One is um, expunging 800,000 felony convictions extends way beyond the cannabis industry. These are people who can't get jobs because they have a felony conviction, not people who can't get jobs in the cannabis industry. Right, they so, can't get jobs because so the, the that's right. You know, the the, uh, the reach of that is is significant, way beyond cannabis. The second thing is, if you look at what's going on in the legislature right now and the people that are speaking out against the bill, Madigan primarily, the biggest pushback is coming from the leniency around the record expungement and the social equity program. And so there's going to be some infighting in between the moderate Democrats and the liberals that control two-thirds majority of both houses around this social equity component. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. It's not going to be a very popular, you know, piece of legislation to be on the wrong side of. Well, this, like we were talking about, I mean, this is basically what sunk legalization in New Jersey so far. I mean, you had, and I think the parallels between Illinois and New Jersey are, are pretty stark, right? You have a, you had a, you had a state, both states where you had a, a, a Democratic either supermajority or very strong majority in both houses, uh, a Republican governor who had done everything he could to try and stifle the program, the medical program, ended up either losing to or in Jersey's case retired, and then Democrat um, in both states ran on legalization as a top priority, pushed the bill in their first year, lots of exuberance that it was going to get passed. Well, we're in year two in Jersey now. And that bill still hasn't passed. And my understanding is a big piece of that was this issue around expungement. Um, uh, from what we hear behind the scenes, uh, there were likely were there were likely were enough votes to get it passed there in the House, but they were a couple of votes short in the Senate. Um, and that was over this issue of expungement and where the threshold should be. In New Jersey, it was any marijuana crimes uh, that included offenses up to 500 pounds. Uh, five pounds, sorry, five pounds. Five hundred pounds would be would be a lot. Yeah, pretty much. But that was seen. But 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 for the for the for the more moderate, uh, for there were a number of moderate more moderate Democrats there who said that's too much. I can't get on board with this bill. 
when they started doing some of the jockeying behind the scenes, saying, all right, well, how about if we lower it? They started losing members of the Black Caucus and Latino Caucus who were saying, no, this impacts members of our community, and we're not going to lower this because we're still going to have a lot of members of our community that are walking around with felony convictions. Um, and so the, the, it, when you have an issue like this where you've got virtually no support from the Republican side of the aisle, um, there are a few, there were a few in Jersey, there's going to be a few here, but by and large, this is a battle that's playing out within the Democratic Party um, you know, you don't have a whole lot of wiggle room if you have virtually nobody from the other side. Um, and you've got moderate Democrats that are going to want it to be a more, uh, a, a little bit more of a restrictive program. And then you've got progressive Democrats that are going to see it much more free and open. And you've got, in both states, again, very strong, very large Latino caucuses, black caucuses that want to make sure that the interests of their communities are being represented. And in some cases, that conflicts with what the moderate Democrats are going to want to see. Um, so I want to come back to the social equity question here in a minute, but I think this is probably a good time to, 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 to sort of ask for predictions. Like, what are folks' thoughts here on how likely this thing is, is actually to get past this, this session? I, I, want, I want everyone on the record here. I think, um, given the amount of time we have, and, uh, and, and we do have a good amount of time. Um, well, this that, session's over in a month, isn't it? Yeah. We only have a month for this session. Yeah. Less, yeah. This month, but, you know, the, Pritzker's saying it's going to be past the session and I sales know, start in July, January 1st. Yeah. Is I, that going to happen? I, I think that it's going to happen. Um, and I think that uh, the, my reasoning for it also has to do with the fact that Social inequity and is a big, big deal. Pritzker really, behind the scenes, I'm told, has worked very hard on this. Um, no doubt about you know, that. No, uh, Rep. Kelly and, and others, and and also the fact that the the, the main constituents in the in the, in the, in, the um, in Illinois have worked hard from a corporate standpoint um, in terms of lobbying as well. So I I think it'll pass. I I, I want to. I'll let the rest of the panel talk, and I want to bring up one more point. All right, we got one yes. Okay, um, so I'm going to remain objective uh, as a journalist and not say one way or the other if I think it's going to pass or fail, but I will tell you what I know. And um, I know that the, the sponsors of this bill have been working on this for a long time. This wasn't something they started putting together as soon as Pritzker got elected. Um, they've been working in the space and on the medical side for years. Um, and for the social equity part of it, that seems to be drawing some ire from some folks now, um, nitpicking, you know, what's wrong with it? What can we do better? Um, the sponsors, again, worked with folks, um, minority groups, um, the Illinois Black Caucus. A lot of different folks came to the table to put this bill together. I'd imagine that's why it's over 500 pages long. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that's also part of why they waited so long to introduce it in this session when they have a few more weeks to get it passed. Um, I think it's partially because they hadn't reached a decision on stuff. I was reporting out a, a diversity story um, a few weeks ago, and at that point, they hadn't nailed down the social equity part of it. So I think this is something that they um, had a lot of people weigh in on, and they thought, you know, how are we going to get this passed, and how do we need to write this language to get it passed um, before they put it in there? So take that as a yes? <laughs> we'll see. We'll okay. see. <laughs> um, I would like to be optimistic. Uh, but I recall all of the problems that surrounded the rollout of the medical program. It took longer to pass the legislation than they thought. It took forever to get the uh, administrative regulations issued. And long before we'll ever have uh, an adult uh, use sale, all of these things are going to have to be worked out. I think it's uh, you know, very, very uh, optimistic of, of them to believe that they can get it past this session. Uh, we don't have any final word on what Michael Madigan has said. And we all know that nothing's going to happen in this state unless Michael Madigan supports it. I think part of what's going on is he's trying to get a feeling of the pulse of that part of the state that lives south of I-80. Uh, and whether the people down there are really going to put their support behind this. I can't speak to that one way or the other because I don't know the answer. Um, but there are a lot of issues out there uh, that do have to be addressed. I'm not saying it can't be done. Um, but I see it as being somewhat problematic. The social justice side of it uh, is certainly the, the bedrock and the foundation of this plan, but even that becomes problematic in terms of uh, or, or is every group that feels like it should be supported getting supported. I've talked to uh, a number of women who are in the cannabis industry, and they're very distressed by the fact that the social equity portion says nothing about women and doesn't provide that there should be uh, loans or situations to allow women-owned businesses 
uh, to be able to get a head start. Will that go anywhere in terms of tripping this up? Again, I don't know. Uh, but there are a lot of issues out there that we haven't been hearing about that are going to have to be resolved before the program can get going. Is that a no? That's a, I don't think so. But I'd like to be wrong. Yeah. I'm going to be a firm no, but I'd like to be wrong. I think the bottom line, uh, as Larry said, it's, nothing gets done in the state without Madigan behind it. Um, he has come out saying that he's not in support of the bill because of the extensive nature of the felony expungements. Um, both the Sun-Times and the Tribune have come out and said, we'd like to see it slowed down. The head of the NAACP has come out against it here because they don't think it goes far enough. With three weeks left in this session, I don't see the state of Illinois moving that fast. Will it happen this year in the next session? And is Pritzker's goal to get this thing forced to a floor vote so that he can flush out everybody's position? I think that's probably more in line with his thinking as a businessman. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say unless something drastic happens and Madigan comes out and says, hey, this is what I want, and he gets it, it's a no for this session. I mean, I'll put myself on record as well. I think it's a probably not. I also very much hope I'm wrong. But look, no, no, despite all the exuberance, right, no state has passed legalization through, through the state legislature yet, period. Uh, Vermont came closest. Um, some consider that legalization. I'd call it like super decrim. Um, basically, it's, you know, it's illegal to possess up to an ounce, to grow up to six plants, to gift it to friends. But there's no legal commercial uh, cannabis in Vermont. They, they, I think they will be the first state to do it. I think it's going to happen this year in Vermont because it's another step. Right? They've already taken that first step. It's really hard to get any... It's really hard to get any semi-controversial legislation passed the first time it's introduced um, because of all these issues that we've been discussing, right? There are, there are constituents that have, there are constituents, there are representatives that represent constituents that have specific concerns that may conflict with other representatives' concerns, even if they, in theory, support legalization. Very hard to get a majority to yes on the first go round. It's the reason why it hasn't happened yet anywhere, despite the fact that nine states in DC have now voted for it. We've, we've, we've adequately demonstrated that the public is in support of legalization, but the legislatures haven't quite figured out how they can get consensus amongst the legislators to get it passed. So I think it's a real uphill battle um, to get this done this year. Um, but And this is Illinois. It's a very much of a what's in it for me. So every one of these voting congressmen and voting senators still has the opportunity to pass the hat around and decide what it is that they want out of this. And I don't think there's enough time left for that to happen. Now, now to be fair, though, they did get some of that already, right? I mean, part of what Pritz, part of what Governor Pritzker did and part of the reason why they waited so long to introduce this bill was that the, they wanted to get the budget passed first. And the budget has money allocated for pet projects all around the state that that is tied directly to cannabis revenue. So if those members don't then vote for cannabis legalization, they don't get the money for their pet, for their pet projects in their districts. Um, does that make anybody a little more optimistic? Or it doesn't make me, but uh, trying, 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 to, trying to come around on the rosy side of this here. Yeah. I think it's certainly a, a benefit towards um, getting a yes vote, but I just don't think it's enough yet. I think that there's more than just you know, $120 million of allocation of tax resources and other things that these legislature, legislators are gonna want baked into this bill, it's going to get, it's an important bill. It's going to get stuffed with all kinds of things before it's passed, in my opinion. Well, the other thing is that he's making all of these predictions about how much revenue he's going to generate off the program, and the program hasn't started yet. And I think that that was a problem when the medical program rolled out, too, that I saw investors who would come in and say, well, we're going to make this much this year and this much the next year, and the program hadn't even gotten off its feet yet. So it's optimistic for, for Pritzker to kind of guess how much money he's going to get out of this program. Uh, but you know, given, given the slowness with everything else, I, I think it's overly optimistic to suggest he's going to be getting that much money initially. I do think that most of the, I could be wrong about this, so correct me if any of you guys know, but I think some of the budget set-asides that he had were from the licensing fees. Yes. I believe that's right. That's yeah. true. But those, those weren't budget set-asides. Those were for the social equity program, right? right. Oh. Right. No, I'm talking about in Pritzker's budget um, for 2019. He had... Yes, he had some line items that he took directly from licensing fees for the recreational program. But doesn't the, doesn't the bill say that there's no new licenses that are going to be awarded yet this no year? No new ones, but the existing license holders are still going to have to pay for their That's recreational right. license. Okay. For, well, let's, let's get into that because we want, to, we want to talk about licensing. I mean, my understanding is we're, you're, we're, we're really not looking at new licenses for a year. Right. It's my understanding. No new licenses for a year for anything. 75 after a year for dispensaries and 20, uh, 40 for uh, craft cultivation, processing, and transportation after a year. 
Okay, so let's sit on the cultivation side first. So that's, that's 40 new craft cultivation licenses a year after the bill passes. What about the existing operators? Um, those get grandfathered in automatically? That's my understanding of the way the bill's written now. They pay their fee and they're automatically granted a recreational license with unlimited capacity. Mostly, yeah. There's, there's yeah, devil's in the details, but yeah, there's always some generally speaking, they, there's some qualifications. Essentially, the idea you guys is. You read all 500 pages of the bill. <laughs> the lawyers. <laughs> yes. Flip, flip the switch for the existing license holders. Wait a year, then grant some more licenses. Um, which look, there, there is. There's, there's a really, there, there actually is a good public policy rationale, and I say this full, you know, full disclosure, I, I, I am, we, we are one of the existing license holders, both in cultivation and retail. I try not to speak out of self-interest here. Um, I've actually argued with my colleagues in a number of states uh, on, on, on whether or not we should add more licensees. I tend to fall on the side of I think we should, um, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, but there is a policy rationale for giving a head start to the existing operators, right? Number one, they did take these massive risks at a time when the, commercial, when, when the program was non-commercial and bled money for many years and so give them a little bit of a head start to recoup some of that. But the biggest one is that they have the infrastructure in place. Right? There's, they're already growing cannabis, and if you want the program to get up and running and you want to provide cannabis to the public uh, as quickly as possible, right? let the folks who are already doing it flip the switch and start growing for adult use as well. Um, they can get to market faster. Even if you start issuing new licenses right away, there's still an administrative process. There's still an application process. Um, then they have to they have to go through zoning and permitting, and you have to actually build out, and you know, plants take four months to grow, so even once you get plants in the ground, it's just, realistically, it's at best case scenario, it's a year after licensing starts before anybody else is even really online. So the initial folks are gonna have an advantage no matter what. And again, there's a public policy rationale for that. My question though is, is there gonna be enough supply to meet demand in this market given how few new licenses we're talking about issuing? I think that, uh with respect to demand, I, initially I'm not particularly concerned about that because most of the growers are not growing on anywhere close to the full square footage that they currently have. Because as was accurately pointed out earlier, there just weren't enough patients to justify, justify that. Um, and it's gonna take a while for new uh, cultivation centers to get up to speed anyway, so we'll find out relatively quickly whether the current cultivators can do it. The, the thing that we were all talking about that I'm a little surprised is uh, not immediately adding more dispensaries because some of the dispensaries that currently exist, uh, certainly on the North Shore, you know, from time to time find themselves running out of product, uh, you know, over-marketed uh, over by people who are choosing those particular dispensaries. And I'm not sure that we can get by on 50 or 55 dispensaries for the entire state if we're gonna have adult use. You have 55 retail outlets for a state of 13 million people. Um, and even they, you know, even they're going to grant 75 more a year later, right? Again, those Still are not gonna enough. Be, it, it's going to be at least a year before those stores start getting open. Right. Um, and and if pre if passes precedent for other states, it'll probably be longer. But I do think they have to protect against a rush of inexperienced operators flooding the market with product that is, you know, has all kinds of problems. They don't have the resources allocated. They don't have the revenues to be able to police all of this. Um, and so I think there's some concern around. If we let too many people in too quickly, how, how are we going to manage the market as well? There's definitely some concern around that. I've heard from growers. Um, the other thing to point out is that most many of these big multi-state growers that are based here and have operations here have been expanding their grow facilities, readying for this since last summer. Um, you know, some of that was to prepare for the growing medical program like we talked about earlier. But um, if you think about these facilities, most of them in Illinois, um, I'm not sure if, if any of you have ever visited one, but um, there are these big unmarked facilities that just look like warehouses in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, but many of them, when they started out, they did build outs and had phases. And for many of them, you know, they only had a few of their, their growing rooms open. And they've been expanding over the past year to add more grow rooms, build out the whole building that they had. But then the other thing to consider is that they can build more buildings. You know, there's a lot of room to grow. If we have a question? 100,000. 100,000, yeah. Okay, yes, good point. But um, some of them weren't at that. They didn't have that full square Very footage close. Right, out. virtually none of them are that. Are that I don't think right. any of them are getting, yeah. getting close. Right. Getting close, yeah. yeah. Right. But even but even then, but let's talk, but let's but let's stay on this, right? So let's let's say you got fi basically fifteen cultivators now, um, and a few of them have have multiple licenses. So really, you know, nineteen essentially that have licenses. So you're talking about one hundred ninety thousand square feet total canopy space, uh, one hundred ninety thousand square feet. Will that serve a market of thirteen million people plus however many tourists come to Chicago every year? Is that enough? So that's one point nine million square feet if they're fully built out. One hundred thousand per. 100,000 per, right, right. So it's 1.9 yeah, yeah. million square feet. 
Correct. It's still, I don't think still, it's enough to is that enough? To, is that enough to market. supply the market? No, so I'd like to throw that back at you as a commercial mm -hmm. grower. What do you yeah. think? Well, we, I don't think it is. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. I don't think we it have, is. We've seen a couple studies come out on this. Um, the there have been there's a study sponsored by the industry. There was a study sponsored by the sponsors of the bill. Um, one of the studies found that um, for at least the first few years, the current growers could supply. Um, that's sort of that's because it takes a few years for a market to reach full maturity. I think it took Colorado four or five years. They say. Um, I mean, I guess that's where we're at, sort of right now with with uh, legalization in Colorado, um, four or five years in, and I think maybe if it's reached maturity now, maturity being full demand. Um, we hear a lot of stories about uh, dispensaries selling out the first day that sales start, um, but also something to consider is that the first day, the first week sales start, there's going to be more sales, and there would be, you know, even two months into the program, just because there's a rush, you know, when a new store opens, when a new product is available. Um, so, but these, you know, these, it, this, the study that um, the sponsors of the bill put out there was done by a firm in Colorado, and they did make a lot of comparisons to the Colorado market, and Illinois is very different. Um, you know, we have a larger population. Um, you know, it's, it's dispersed differently. There's a lot of things to consider here. Um, I, I think. And you're not going to have 1.9 million square feet. Right? right. Not everybody's, not all of those growers are going to be 100,000 square feet, right? Some of the building, I mean, look, our, our building maxes out at 94,000 square feet, and that's not all canopy space. Um, right. That's your. That's your. That's your total space, footprint. Your, yeah. yeah, that's the total footprint, and that and so that includes the processing areas and and drying and hallways and everything else. Um, so. Processing. Uh, yeah, all, all of it. It all has to fit within that with, within within the, the the physical building that we have. Um, I mean, are, so are we looking at a like a, a major supply problem in Illinois if this bill passes as it currently stands? I think that the the biggest concern would be, and I could be wrong about this again. Um, would be the dispensary side of things. Because that number seems way off to me from all the studies that I've seen. It only has 75. Yeah. Um, and then, what, 75 in a, a year later, which will take time for them to come yeah. online as well? Right. We saw that in Massachusetts, when they first rolled out adult use, they only had, I think, initially three dispensaries. Two. And, and two none of them were yeah. located in major metropolitan areas. So the either. first one in Boston just opened about a month ago, right. in Boston metro area in Brookline. And, and yeah. so, right, but you know, prior to that, you had people like you know, getting up at 3 in the morning to drive to these locations to get there before they ran out of product. I think that it's, it's, it's a natural part of it. And they all, have, they all have limits in Massachusetts uh, products. So if you, go in as a, if you go in as an adult use consumer to, to buy cannabis at one of the legal dispensaries in, in Mass, at this point, still virtually every one of them will have a limit on how much you can purchase that's well below what the state limits are. Uh, because right. I think it's the only way they can keep product in, in, in house. Right. And I think with dispensaries too, um, if you look at the map now from where the 55 dispensaries are located, the map of Illinois, there are some big holes. Um, part of that is because there were, I believe, a handful of licenses that were never awarded or were awarded and the dispensaries never opened. Um, you know, Mission is the only one, you know, sort of on the south part of the city. So there are some holes there, even considering the population. Obviously, in rural Illinois, there's a population disparity there. Um, but there are some holes, so that would be something else. I think, I think you know, erring on the side of caution, uh, and Larry, you're the, the most legal uh, trained here, if the program is going well and there's huge demand, can't they amend this program at some point? Always. They can always so, amend anything. Yeah. No, I but, think, it takes, but that takes time, right? You've got to issue more licenses. They've got to build out, right? I mean, you've got to recognize it's, it's from licensure to opening, it's best case it's a year. I, what, what, I, what, I, what I think we got right here in Illinois, and I can't underscore this enough as I look at this room and I see maybe a couple of people of color here, is that we got the disenfranchised right, and, and that's a big deal here to me. In the bill, you mean? Yeah. If it's not in the medical program. The way that it is. No, not in the medical program, but in the bill, if that right. passes. You know, we were talking about the odds of the bill passing, right? And, and, you know, there's other incentives. At some point, it might be one year, two years, four years out, where demand meet supply, um, there are, I believe, those that read the bill, f all 500 pages, some benefits to, um, to including people of color and disenfranchised in terms of um, lower um, fees, as, as well as, um, I think, uh, lower taxation. Right. So, they, I mean, they're trying, the bill's trying to address the fact that, they're, that, that, that folks from disproportionately impacted communities, primarily people of color, people from communities that have been most targeted by the drug war, have an opportunity to participate in the new legal, new legal economy, uh, which is something I think everybody would admit the medical program did not do well. Um, there's very few people of color, very few women represented amongst ownership in the current medical industry in Illinois. Um, and there's a recognition that we need to create 
avenues avenues to entry into the industry. You know, particularly uh, particularly when we're talking about a a, a, a a drug war marijuana prohibition that's been essentially fought on the backs of young people of color. Um, right, that there that there needs to be an avenue for for, for these folks to participate. I will say I'm skeptical uh, that the provisions in the bill will will really achieve this goal. Um, I agree. Now, I, I think I, I, it's it's laudable the way that they've done this, but the, and and frankly, I'm not sure that there is a way that they could write it that would achieve the goal. Um, well, look, I mean, a five thousand square foot facility. We're talking about craft grows. Five thousand. Right. Yeah. How can a five thousand square foot craft grower compete with a hundred thousand? Exactly. Square and how much of a craft? grower market is there going to be I mean, we have a lot of craft breweries in chicago so you know there, there will be a craft grower market but the problem is most of the craft growers are not going to grow craft quality cannabis correct right? especially Just because you have a small years. grow doesn't mean you're a great grower um and so yes the smaller growers that grow the best quality product there will absolutely be a market for that product but if they're growing mediocre quality product they cannot compete on price with somebody who's growing in a hundred thousand square foot facility and so th that's, that, that will make things very difficult. My concern, though, is it's expensive to get these businesses up and running. Even a 5,000 square foot craft grow is probably going to cost close to a million dollars to get operational, right? A dispensary is still going to cost you, best case scenario, half a million dollars to get operational. Where does that money come from, right? The bill sets aside, what, $20 million to go into a, a, a fund, to, a fund yeah. to, to help fund social equity applicants? It's 20 grows at best, like absolute best case scenario that'll cover 20 grows. So where does the money come from to ensure that the social equity applicants can actually get their businesses operational. Right, and that's why you have the same that they had in Oakland where you've got larger companies in business and affluent investors um, trying to find you know, minorities and equity uh, participants to front for them. And then you have to start to police that. And in the application process, that becomes very difficult and you run into very different. problems. Yeah. Well, there were bonus points, as I recall, in the medical applications for... Uh, there were bonus points, right. yeah. It didn't do, it didn't oh, do it, a whole lot. Right, it didn't do a whole lot. And, you know, and I don't like to use the term social engineering, but I mean, part of what they're trying to do here is create a solution. I admire what they're trying to do, and I think it's the right way, but in theory, but whether or not it can actually play out specifically uh, and create the type of opportunities that they want, I, you know, we'll have to see. So um, this is just speaking from my reporting. This isn't an opinion or anything. Um, but so... Many other states have started thinking about the social equity point um, when they came online with their medical programs. Many states east of here, Ohio, for example, um, New York, I believe, a lot of them built into their application programs social equity points. You know, they awarded points for you know certain things. They required companies applying to um, tell them how they would make sure their workforce was diverse and lay out that business plan from the get-go. Um, you know, Ohio, I believe, awarded a certain number of licenses to companies with diversity ownership, that sort of thing. Um, Pennsylvania did a lot, too. Pennsylvania, exactly. Um, speaking with the lawmakers here when they were crafting this bill, they were saying, you know, other states have tried, but no one's gotten it right yet, and we want to be that state to get it right. So some of the things that they were telling me was that, you know, like you guys make good points, but also the that's – having other licenses, having other types of licenses. So with the medical program right now, we have growers and sellers, and that's it. So with the recreational program, there would be delivery licenses. Transportation, transportation and processing. And processing licenses. Um, so that offer, offers um, you know, more avenues of entry into the industry. Um, there are also companies here, Revolution Enterprises is one of them, um, that have already started working with folks that are in these opportunity areas. Um, that are interested in getting into the industry and weren't able to get in for whatever reason on the first time around, and they're helping to train them, just prepare them for the application process, which can take you know months just to build a team to do that, um, train them on growing practices and that sort of thing, just to sort of help lower the barrier of entry. Um, so there's a, a lot of industry operators that have already been thinking about this too, but you know again, take that with a grain of salt because these are the big guys. Um, and how would a new entrant ever be able to compete with a multi-state operator at this point? So, well, so what we're, I mean, I think what we're starting to see, and this, you know, this becomes a very delicate balancing act, um, is this, this sort of partnership between MSOs and social equity license holders. And we're starting to see this around the country. And I mean, I've made the case, it was a shameless plug alert, right? I wrote, a, I wrote a, a, a column for Forbes last year about how the lack of access to banking is particularly harming mom and pop business, uh, mom and pop owners and social equity applicants, right? Because if, you if, if you're a license holder of say, you know, one of, we're looking after they grant 75 licenses, we're looking at what, around 130 
retail licenses in a state of 13 million people. Right? If you had one of those licenses and this was not federally legal, any bank in the state, any bank in the country would give you a, you know, a small business loan or a loan to get your, get your business up and running. Right? Access to capital would not be that challenging to someone in, in a market that's still, that, where the licenses are so limited. But in the absence of that, where do you go for money? And I think we're at a point now where you know, we talk about how much more capital there is in the industry, and there's a lot more capital we've seen come into the industry in the last two years. But I would actually argue it's more difficult for the mom and pops today to access their capital than it was two years ago 100%. because you have so many operators that have so much experience. And so if you're a cannabis-focused fund or a, 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 an individual angel investor or a family office, which is where 99% of the money is coming from these days, right? They're going to be much more comfortable putting their money into a company that has a proven track record rather than into somebody that's a startup that has to compete against these companies with proven track records. So right now we've created a situation because of federal prohibition and the lack of access to banking where the really the most... Uh, the, 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 the most viable source of capital for the mom and pops are the large players. Um, and that, you know, that, and that, and that, that, that's not inherently a terrible thing um, if it's done the right way, but it also can be very explo exploitative. Um, and, and we've seen it done in a way that, it, you know, that is not really beneficial for the, for the social equity applicants where they really just do become front, uh, you know, front faces for the MSOs rather than the MSOs empowering them to be actual entrepreneurs and business owners in the space. I think you're right. And I think that what we're really going to see here uh, is that social equity can only go so far as long as marijuana stays a Schedule One, And, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room that, you know, people have these conversations but we don't focus on enough is why is it a Schedule One? I mean, not the, 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 the history and all of that, but today... That's another and, panel. Right. And today is, you know, in, you know in, intelligent people who understand and know and, and see why we haven't been able to move this off of Schedule One and really off of Schedule Two. And once we can do that and we solve the banking problems, that will solve these issues that we're talking about because people will have access to small loans. So I think, and Alec, like, you have one more, one more point to make and then we're gonna open up for would, questions. Yeah, sorry, I was just gonna say that, um, you know, there's also the um, folks here in Illinois that support um, opening up the banking system. But again, there are a lot of small community banks here that, a few that work with the industry now, um, but also many of them won't touch it until it's federally not a schedule one. Anymore. You have money laundering problems for these yeah. banks and the bankers, it unless like they pass money. the SAFE Act, which is currently uh, before Congress uh, on the federal level, which would uh, remove a lot of these restrictions in states that have programs. But in the absence of that, any banker who, who does the business, the individual banker potentially faces criminal penalties. So, you know, banks are very disincentivized right now to do this. But again, if we take this off of Schedule 1 and Schedule 2, that problem goes away. My daughter thinks that we're an episode of Ozark. <laughs> Spend all of our time trying to move money through the banking system. So now that the, the series has ended, they call me once a week to get an update.